tonight on the final play. When the game's over and you don't have success, you got to be able to at least grasp how come that happened. The Saints' search for a winning formula has taken them back to the drawing board in West Virginia. We'll break down the progress with NOLA.com columnist Jeff Duncan. Plus, I just know I could do that regardless. I know I've, I know I've been gifted with a good arm. All these guys around here, we're all going our junior year, so when a lot of us have played a lot of football, and uh, I think it's a reason to have excitement around here. Quarterback confidence is in surplus at both LSU and Tulane now, but how will it play out on the field? We'll check in on both programs. And we're taking a look around the NFC South to see how the first week of preseason football treated the Saints division foes. From Fox 8 Sports, this is the final play. Brought to you by Southern Quality Ford Dealers and Oceana Grill. Welcome into the final play. I'm Juan Kincaid with 12 Greenbrier workouts now in the books. The Saints will wrap up the West Virginia portion of training camp this week with workouts number 13 and 14 on Monday and Wednesday. And by all accounts, Sean Payton's gotten exactly what he hoped for out of year three at the country club. All except, of course, a win in last Thursday's preseason opener in New England. Sean Mazan has more from Saints training camp. They're the position group the Saints invested the most in this offseason. And at this stage of camp, you can say that investment in linebackers has paid off. I think we've helped ourselves in that area, and that's encouraging. The new faces are James Laurinaitis, Craig Robertson, and Nate Stupar. They join forces with Danell Ellerby, the currently injured Stephon Anthony, and Michael Maudie. I think we're more athletic at that position group as a whole. In nowhere is that athleticism more obvious than in their pass coverage. Once a major deficiency in the Saints defense, the ability to cover is now looking more like a strength. Robertson has had several pass breakups in practice. In Thursday's opener, Ellerby had a great pass breakup on the sideline, while Stupar saved a touchdown with a PBU of his own in the end zone. I have a lot of uh, pride in that because, I mean, being a linebacker, they, they see you as a mismatch, especially linebacker on a receiver, linebacker on the tight end or something like that. So when you're, you're able to go out and put up and... I ain't going to say lockdown, but you're able to do your job. I mean, it's, it's a plus. You don't handicap the defense. It's a trait that's no longer considered a luxury for an NFL team to have. In today's league, having linebackers that can cover is becoming a necessity. It's something you have to do in this league now. Uh, you know, they still run the ball, but it's a pass-first league. And, I mean, with the ability to cover, you know, that's something you guys, that's, you know, you need for the defense. You know, if they can find the weakness, they're going to exploit that all game. So you definitely need guys. That's, that's going to cover and, and help in that aspect. It puts more speed on the field, guys that, that can run and cover. And obviously, there are elements to our game, not exclusively, but there are elements to our game that, um, that are more opened up and, and more demanding of, of guys that can move. The final two workouts at the Greenbrier will lead the Saints into their next challenge, Saturday's second preseason game in Houston. They'll have a day off between their two final workouts on Monday and Wednesday, and they'll begin their second set of joint practices on Thursday and Friday, this time against the Houston Texans. The game kicks off Saturday night, 6.30. Of course, you know it can only be seen right here on Fox 8. Back to camp now. Once again, here's Sean Sand. Pleased to be joined now by NOLA.com, the Times Picayune's lead sports columnist, Jeff Duncan. And Jeff, we just ran the story about uh, the depth at the linebacker position. It really seems like early on that that position has really showed up here at camp. Yeah, you can see the new free agent additions, uh, Nate Stuper, James Laranitis, and Nicholson uh, are all guys that I think have been around the block in this league and guys that can run and that's something they desperately needed at the linebacker position we all know how they struggled to cover tight ends and running backs a year ago so I think that's why they were brought in Laronitis I don't think is going to be a big playmaker for this team at this stage of his career he looks like the quarterback of the defense he's gonna be the Drew Brees get them in the right play but these other guys I think are going to be out there a lot in their sub packages uh, trying to defend the pass in these critical third down situations that this team really struggled at a year ago. Yeah, they just seem to be more active in pass coverage this year than I can remember really any of the Sean Payton era. You've been here for a couple of weeks now. Uh, you've seen the first preseason game. You've kind of, you know, gauged the flow of things. I mean, do you have a good read right now if this team is actually better than where they were a year ago? I think they're definitely better. Okay. Now, whether they win more games or not, I think remains to be seen. It's going to come down to breaks. Do they stay healthy? Uh, but they're clearly better at a number of spots. Uh, but again, the schedule's more difficult this year, too. I think what Sean Payton's been talking about, this team needs to get off to a quick start. 
I think that's going to be a big point of emphasis. If you look historically with Sean Payton's teams, when they start 3-1 and one or 4-0, and oh, they make the playoffs. When they start 1-3 and three or 2-2, two and two, they don't. And I think he realizes the schedule toughens later in the year, so this team's got to get off to a good start. And then everybody buys in. You get a little confidence. All those things matter. And I think it's set up for them to get off to a good start. You mentioned they're better, and I agree with you. I, I do think they're better. Where do you think uh, is the biggest improvement with this team? Well, you mentioned linebacker core. I think they're better there. They're deeper there. But I think the biggest area that I've seen them improve is the secondary. I mean, they, they had to get better. They had such a struggle last year, but they also were very banged up, had a lot of injuries. They got a lot of young players. There are going to be a lot of new faces in this secondary. A lot of young guys that I think have talent, and I think because they have such youth there, we're going to see a lot of ups and downs. There are going to be some growing pains. But there's a foundation there, I think, for the future that Saints fans should feel good about. On the flip side, you know, you never want to get too excited about what you see. Um, so w where would you say is the biggest, I guess, area of concern for this team right now? I think it's pretty, pretty easy to spot. I think the offensive line is an area that they're going to move Andres Pete to right guard. They're going to sink or swim with the young kid there. But I think that's an area where they lack depth. They don't have much experience there. They cannot afford injuries anywhere along that offensive line. Taron Armstead, I think, is the second most important player on this team. They need him to stay healthy. He got hurt a year ago. And that's an area I think we can see the Saints look at the waiver yep. wire later in camp, no look, maybe look for a veteran player to come in and compete at that guard position. But that's an area I think uh, that they're very thin at. It happens every year. An undrafted guy sort of... Uh, bursts his way onto the scene to the point where the coaches cannot get rid of him. He earns his spot uh, on this roster. Have you located that guy or players or multiple players uh, in that regard? I think there's four okay. undrafted guys can make this roster. Uh, clearly the cornerbacks, and we mentioned the cornerback position, King Crawley and Devontae Harris are going to make this team. I don't know if they're going to make the final 53, but they're going to be on either the practice squad, uh, but they're both very talented, they, and it's not too big for them. You see the confidence that they carry themselves with on the field. Uh, Tommy Lee Lewis, a young uh, uh, running back, kind of satellite back. Uh, he's got a skill set that this team could use. You know, he's very fast. I think he's got a shot. Unfortunately, he's competing with some veteran players that have the same skill set, but you can yeah. see the talent. And then the other guy, I think we talked about the offensive line, Jack Allen is going to be the backup center. It's a matter of if they keep eight offensive linemen or seven. Yeah. Uh, but I think he's got a great shot to make this team as well. And that's a pretty good undrafted rookie class if you've got four guys that could make the roster. Yeah, it certainly is going to be fun to watch how this 53 roster kind of kind of comes together. And as you said, that waiver wire is always something to watch once that final 53 is announced. Uh, Jeff Duncan, NOAA.com, thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me. A ton more Saints news and analysis is now at your fingertips with our new app, the Final Play app. Be sure to download the new app for Saints coverage, and as a bonus, when you download it, you have a chance to win a final play getaway, which includes sweet tickets to a Saints game, dinner for two, and a two-night hotel stay. More pro football later in the show when we go around the NFC South, but up next, we're talking college football, where LSU has lost a New Orleans native to a transfer. And Tulane's Mandeville High product, Glenn Coulier, is talking a good game about his chances of starting at quarterback for the Green Wave. You're watching The Final Play. Welcome back to the final play where you've probably heard by now that the LSU Tigers have lost one of their prized 2015 recruits. Wide receiver Tyron Johnson is leaving LSU. The former Warren Easton standout tweeted his intentions to transfer last Thursday. Johnson was the state's top ranked recruit back in 2015 and was at one time the Tigers number three receiver last season. But his lack of production at that position led to him falling further on the depth chart. He did have a couple of touchdown catches last season, but now he's moving on to hopefully a better fit for his skill set. Meanwhile, back on campus, the Tigers' build up to their September 3rd opener against Wisconsin continues. And just as it was at the start of last year's season opener, LSU still looking for ways to make on-field life easier for quarterback Brandon Harris. They know that the key to the team's overall success is Harris's success under center. Last year, offensive coordinator slash quarterback coach Cam Cameron bolted the booth for the sidelines so he could be in Harris's ear. And they had some success with that. And Harris believes it could be a benefit again this season. Um, and, you know, it's just, I think it's a better communication with Cam being on the sideline just because I'm able to communicate with him face to face, you know, rather than talking over a headset. Not that that really matters. It just is more important to me as a quarterback because there's some things that I see down there field level 
um, that he may see differently up in the in the box. And um, it's not that it's not, I'm not going to you know put any more emphasis on. It's not something dr drastic. I mean, we did have one of our better games with him on the sideline, um, and I just look forward to him being down there this season. Meanwhile, uptown, it seems like the expectations for Tulane by their conference foes hasn't changed in the last decade. And too much unknown is a reason why. Here's Chris Hagan. The pressure is up for Tulane despite the expectations being a bit down. Speaking at Media Day last Wednesday, the Green Wave say they don't buy into the preseason rankings, but in the same breath, being picked to finish last in the conference serves as motivation. We know, like, we're coming into all the bad season three and nine last year that we was going to be the underdogs. So we already had that motivation in our head, and our goal this year is to get to a bowl game. But it's going to take more than just the right mindset to prove their doubters wrong. They'll have to prove that they have the talent. Their numbers are currently down with just 91 players, and none of their quarterbacks have game experience. Still, head coach Willie Fritz has set the bar high. So we want to win every game, you know. It's... I would go out there and play. It's not, you know, hey, let's, I think we got a chance in these four or five, and these are going to be tough. I, I see coaches, I, if a coach talks about that on my staff, I'm going to get after his butt. They, they don't do it on my staff. I hear guys say, hey, we got a chance in these. And, you know, she, we we want to win every, every game we play. That's, that's how we're competing and practicing on a daily basis. The transition to Coach Fritz at Tulane didn't come without its bumps in the road. A number of players left the program, and a few were wide receivers and quarterbacks, likely worried that the Green Wave's new offense wouldn't feature their abilities. But Coach Fritz says don't be so quick to assume that they're strictly a run-heavy team. He says priority number one is playing to the strength of his players. We would like to, to be a team that, that can be 50-50. I've been impressed. We've done a great job of, of completing the deep ball in all uh, parts of the field, outside, over the middle of the field. Uh, it's been good. And uh, there's no doubt in my mind that all three of our quarterbacks can throw the football. I want one of them to step up and be a great runner as well. You know, the run game opens up the pass game. The pass game opens up the run game. Three two-lane signal callers duke it out uptown to earn the first snaps of the season against Wake Forest in less than a month. Glenn Couye, Darius Bradwell, and Jonathan Brantley say they're competing, but also helping each other get better at the same time. For Couye, when Devin Powell transferred, he immediately became the elder quarterback in the room. Now it's just about proving he's ready to take the reins passing and running. I mean, I'm not trying to be conceited or cocky when I say this. I just know I could do that regardless. I know I've, I know I've been gifted with a good arm, good enough arm to get the balls there, put it on time, you know, make every throw that I could possibly make. And, you know, I just don't. I already know I could prove being a passer, so I just want to prove that I can be a runner in this offense because I just think at the end of the day, that's what I need to prove to myself and Coach Fritz. That being said, don't rule out the possibility of a starter still not being determined for the start of the regular season. If we go into week one and we're unsure, we'll play two guys. I've done that before. If one guy's clear cut, we'll play that one guy. Uh, I, I, I'm sure I'm going to know a lot more about our football team you know, after two or three games, and I do after 29 practices. So uh, there's no substitute for seeing what a guy can actually do in a, in a real ball game. Covering Tulane football, I'm Chris Hagan for the final play. And with that, we're a week closer to the start of the college football season, and all of our teams open on the road. Tulane with a Thursday night game at Wake Forest. On September 3rd, LSU plays a nationally televised game at Lambeau Field against Wisconsin, while Southeastern makes the trek to Oklahoma State. Nichols, their season gets underway in week two against Georgia. Back to the Green Wave for a second. They're reportedly one of 17 schools set to interview with the Big 12 Conference about membership. The conference currently has 10 members, but is looking to expand. No comment from the Green Wave Athletic Department. The Wave have been members of the American Athletic Conference for two of the three years in its existence. Still to come on the final play, we hit the road for an NFC South preview. What kinds of challenges will the Saints face in their attempts to win their first division title since 2011? And later, we take a pause and pay homage to Mr. Peter Finney. Here's what we know about the NFC South. It's Carolina's title to lose because for the past three seasons, they've never lost it. 
what was once known as the division that no team could repeat as winners, the Panthers have shot that out of the water by finishing on top every season since 2013. And when you combine that with their runner-up finish in the Super Bowl, the Panthers are the favorites to win again. Having Cam Newton doesn't hurt either, getting the start in Thursday night's preseason opener against Baltimore. Newton to Brenton Burson for a pickup of nine yards. Later to Kelvin Benjamin, he's back from injury for a short five-yard gain. And then to Ted Ginn Jr. for another nine yards. Completion, Newton five of six in one series. Later in the first quarter, 3-0 Panthers back up. Derek Anderson gets his turn, finds Delvin Funches for a 10-yard touchdown. Panthers up 10-0 at that point. In the second quarter, Ravens down 10-zip still. Fourth and goal, Terrence West jumps over defenders and in for the one-yard score. Ravens down 10-7, they come back to win it. 22 to 19. Not that results matter. Oh, there are some really good things. The biggest disappointment, as I told you guys that night, was we didn't score a touchdown with that first bunch. We drove down to the red zone and we missed a couple of blocks. I mean, in each of those, those first two runs, if we make a couple of blocks, we got them. And in the second one, um, Teddy came out of his rock. Teddy didn't think he was the primary, so you know he assumed the ball was thrown, and you know, and then, and then uh, Cam made the decision to throw it to him. And, and if Teddy just kept going, it'd have been a touchdown. So, you know, we had some opportunities, and that, like I said, was the biggest disappointment was we didn't put it in the end zone. Uh, defensively, there were some good things, but we were spotty on our tackles. You know, we missed a couple of big third down plays that we should have made on the defensive side. Staying in the division, Tampa Bay and Philadelphia. First down and 10 for the Bucks. Jameis Winston stripped by Fletcher Cox. Cox recovers the fumble, and the Bucks had the ball at the nine-yard line. Eagles with another turnover. Off the turnover, third and goal at Tampa Bay's three-yard line. Former Saint quarterback Chase Daniels scrambles to the end zone for the touchdown. Eagles up 14-0. Bucks with the ball once again. Second and 10, Winston finds former LSU Tiger Russell Shepard. He gallops in for 26-yard touchdown. Roberto Aguayo misses the extra point. Tampa, they're on the board, though, down 14-6. Second overall draft pick, Carson Wentz, enters the game for the two-minute drill before the half. Philly fans, they love him, give him a standing ovation. His second play from scrimmage, they so show why. Wentz finds Zach Ertz, 19-yard gain. First NFL completion for Wentz. Eagles get the win, 17-9. As for those dirty birds, Atlanta taking on Washington, pick it up second quarter. Falcons down 3 0. Matt Schaub takes the snap, goes deep to Aldrick Robinson for the 47 yard gain. The defensive pass interference would be declined, of course. Why not? Later in the drive, third and goal, Schaub avoids pressure, looks to Devonta Freeman in the end zone. He can't come up with the catch. Atlanta would tie the game with a field goal at three apiece. Next Falcons possession, Schaub. Goes play action, rolls to his left, goes deep to Robinson, and he makes the leaping grab, picks up a few extra yards. It's a 68-yard game. Later in that same drive, second and goal, Brandon Wilde punches it in from a yard out for the touchdown. Falcons up 10-3. They go on to win 23-17. Up next, saying goodbye to a legend in our business. Peter Finney, he's being remembered this weekend in part as a man that could put into words what most people were thinking, and it didn't matter the subject matter. Mr. Pete made it make sense. By now, you've probably heard that Pete Finney left us on Saturday, taking his last breaths at his New Orleans home. Nancy Parker takes a look back on the career of a man many of us called a mentor and a friend. His columns just reflected, you know, the pulse of New Orleans. Peter Finney's love of sports turned into a real job when he was just 17 years old. The Jesuit grad started covering stories for the New Orleans Item newspaper in 1945 for 20 bucks a week. His father was down meeting a friend and said, hey, you know, I hear there's an opening for a, somebody to cover prep sports for, yeah. the, uh, for the item. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what he did. Uh, he, his name got thrown into the hopper, and the rest is history. Well over 10,000 articles later, his words about sports in New Orleans and beyond matter. I think Peter uh, stacked up against any of the great writers in this country, and great sports writers. Angus Lynn worked with Finney for decades at the New Orleans State's item, and then the Times-Picayune. He had a knack of asking questions that the guy on the street wanted to know. With his God-given talent to spin words, 
he just put it into just pure prose from a sports writer's standpoint. Finney grew up in the French Quarter in the 1940s, an altar boy at St. Louis Cathedral. He stayed here. He, this was his home. Back in the 50s, horse racing and yeah. boxing were real big. Huge. Of course, they've kind of you know fallen off. But uh, he started writing his five times a week column in the 60s, and he had to come up with a, a column a day, so he really had to cover the waterfront. He's profiled sports greats like Joe DiMaggio, Joe Namath, Jack Nicklaus. The 1986 Masters, when Jack Nicklaus won at 46, okay. that was an amazing thing. Peter Finney was in Tulane Stadium when the Saints played the very first game against the Los Angeles Rams in 1967. And he was in Miami when the Saints won the Super Bowl more than 40 years later. It started off in total disbelief this actually happened. Finney told the story when Muhammad Ali beat Leon Spinks in the Dome in 1978. He wrote, there was some periodic wrestling on the ropes between the two, but the closest Ali came to vaudeville were a few shuffle steps when he knew he had a champion of seven months in the bag. 17 times Louisiana Sports Writer of the Year, yeah. the guy could write. Uh, just some fascinating, wonderful uh, memories of, of just iconic moments in Louisiana and New Orleans sports history. And when Eastern Airlines Flight 66 from New Orleans crashed in New York in June of 1975, he happened to be in New York on a sports story. He covered the plane crash. And people at the paper are saying, wait a minute, he's a sports writer. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he wasn't just a sports writer. He was a newsman. What he had to call on his wealth of knowledge, few people have. Mm -hmm. It's like he was a, a, a Rolodex of people and files and numbers all in his head. When his full-time gig at the paper ended in 2011, he kept writing as a columnist. His words through the decades will be in print forever. His knowledge shared with generations of future sports writers looking for the real story. He was something else. You know, at the end, they, they called him Paw Paw, you know, and, and uh, Finns. Uh, and they had a lot of fun. And the New Orleans is so lucky, so blessed to have had a talent like that for so long. Peter Finney was 88 years old. Nancy Parker, Fox 8 News. Back on Super Bowl Sunday, February 7th, we were thankful to have Pete's son, Peter Finney Jr., on the final play to talk about his dad's book before its release. Titled, The Best of Peter Finney, Legendary New Orleans Sports Writer, has since been published and released. You can pick up your copy at a number of local bookstores. And the funeral for Mr. Finney will be private in lieu of flowers. The family requests donations to Catholic Charities Archdiocese of New Orleans. And that's the final play for this Sunday night. For all of us here at Fox 8, I'm Juan Kincaid. Have a great night. The final play was brought to you by Southern Quality Ford Dealers and Oceana Grill.